we go. Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Cynthia Holt and I am the Executive Director for the Council of Atlantic Academic Libraries. Uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome you all to our uh, webinar, uh, Megamawe, the Land of the Mi'kmaq. Um, we, uh, just a few things uh, in terms of uh, the uh, housekeeping things. Uh, if possible, please uh, keep yourself muted and also um, uh, turn off your video uh, during the session just to optimize the, uh, the experience for others who may have uh, low bandwidth. Uh, we will be holding uh, questions and answers until the end of the session. Uh, I'll be monitoring the chat so you can put your questions either in the chat or when we get to the Q&A section, you can unmute yourself and ask the question uh, that way. Um, I would like to uh, start first uh, with uh, an acknowledgement that CALL CVPA represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit and the Nutsivut, Nunatukavut, and, uh, and the Inu of Natasinan, uh, the Eoth. Eothic and the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, in Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. Uh, in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wulostokiuk, uh, the Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. And we at Call CBPA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Uh, so it's my pleasure today to introduce Gerald Claude. Uh, Gerald uh, is a true innovator himself. He is a forerunner sharing his knowledge and raising awareness of the Mi'kmaq people, uh, culture and heritage. Gerald is a renowned Mi'kmaq artist um, and has uh, been recognized for being chosen for the Royal Canadian Mint's My Canada, My Inspiration coin design contest. Uh, Gerald honors the Mi'kmaq Nation by sharing Mi'kmaq stories, legends, archaeology, and history through his many presentations with the Mi'kmaq uh, Divert Cultural Center. Um, and you can also see that he is a big fan of action figures in the background, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I find very fascinating. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Gerald. Welcome, Gerald. Well, thank you very much. I do, do believe this is my second session. And um, today's presentation is going to be more on the homeland of the Mi'kmaq people and um, the districts that we have. Now, uh, again, this is going to be a PowerPoint presentation and I've got several slides that we're going to run through. And again, as I said, at the end, I'll get access to some of your questions because right now when the, my presentation's running I can't see anything can't see the chat the comments so I might as well go on with the show um, again I am coming from the Mi'kmaq de Burt Cultural Center which is uh, an archaeology site based in uh, about 20 kilometers from the Millbrook First Nation and it's one of the oldest dated archaeological sites over here in eastern Canada uh, we're part of the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, which again is one of four tribal organizations that govern the Mi'kmaq here in the province of Nova Scotia. And as the name suggests, the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq covers all of the Mi'kmaq on mainland Nova Scotia. The Union of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq is the Cape Breton bunch, that there's a second tribal organization. Uh, third tribal organization is the Nova Scotia Native Council which represents off-reserve uh, natives as well as the non-status and Bill C-31. And um, the fourth and final governance is our traditional Grand Council, which uh, still has its, uh, its say in a lot of our decision-making. So yeah, I'm with the Confederacy. I'm actually a silly servant. I'm a, a, an employee of the province under the Department of Education. And as uh, an educator, I work with uh, curriculum development as well as interpretations for museums and signage for different historic sites throughout the province. So I've got a fun job as a researcher and uh, I share some of that with you today, I guess. Uh, oh, I hit fudge and it didn't go anywhere. What happened there? So, 
little technical difficulty here. We popped it up and you guys can see it, but it's not advanced. Oh, there we go, hopefully. Hopefully they're not all that slow advancing. But uh, today we're gonna to be talking about Mi'kma'ki. Uh, Mi'kma'ki, the land of the Mi'kmaq. And even in that verb-based language, uh, we're gonna be looking a lot at the language. So breaking that up, Mi'kma'ki, uh, meaning the land of the Mi'kmaq, you look at Unamagi, it still has that magi on the end, that there is the land of fog. So breaking it up in a verb-based language, you're looking at the word, uh, it's either something that's descriptive or something that is distinctive. Uh, this is the map that encompasses Mi'kmaq, all of Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, um, the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec, uh, the central and eastern shores of New Brunswick, as well as just a bit of the northern Maine with our Rustic Nation. We are running into both um, Mi'kmaqs, which is what the old name they used to call us here in the Maritime Provinces. Uh, the Americans still call them Mi'kmaqs, uh, the Penobscot and the Passamaquoddy. So, uh, and again, on that map, you can see in that orangey brown color is the uh, traditional or contemporary names, I should say, that we have today, Newfoundland, Quebec, New Brunswick, et cetera. And the black are the traditional names. Now, there were nine distinctive districts that our, our region was broken up into, just like Canada being broken up into the provinces and territories and the United States being broken up into the different states. Uh, the land of Mi'kma'ki was broken up into these distinctive different areas. And uh, the nine of them, two of them are combined nations. So it gives us a total of seven districts here in uh, Mi'kma'ki. Um, it goes back to some of our earliest archeological evidence and that there is Mi'kma'ki de Burt the archaeology site I was speaking about, um, they found some 4,600 formal tools and they also unearthed some 18 fire hearths. And these fire hearths had carbon that could be radiocarbon dated quite accurately. Uh, it shows a thousand years of occupation. Some of the dates we're getting from these fire hearths are 10.1 thousand years ago to 11.1 thousand years ago. And we use the average of 10.5 thousand years ago. And those are radiocarbon dated years. When you um, convert that to actual physical calendar years, it relates to 13,300 for sort of our midpoint. And the earliest ones probably being closer to 14,000 years ago at the last of the Wisconsin glaciation. But against these tools, um, they not only tell us about um, the types of tools that they were using and the way of life that they lived, but they're talking about the geological knowledge that they had. These tools are male made from semi-precious jewels, and these material is created in certain places and they're formed under certain conditions. Now, 14,000 years ago, when the Mi'kmaq first moved into this area, they brought with them that knowledge. They had a knowledge of geology uh, before they even got here. Because like I say, when we're looking at tools that are 13,300 years ago, um, they definitely knew um, the semi-precious material. And um, basically the first finds were found in 1948. It was found on a military base at Camp de Burt. And the area was being prepared for a recreational field like combination soccer field and um, softball field. And when they plowed this area level, they unearthed some of the first artifacts and they were found by Mr. Ernest Eaton. Him and his wife, Edith, were in the area picking blueberries in the town of DeBert. And Mr. Eaton was the Dean of the Agricultural College here in Bible Hill. And uh, it's now part of the Dalhousie campus. But he had a bit of a background in archaeology and he knew what he was looking at. So when he found that first point and it was a Clovis style point, he knew that it was quite significant and he knew that there had to be further studies and digs done in this area. But being built on a military base, uh, Canada had a higher priority and that was the war effort. 
So the archaeology actually didn't take place until the 1960s. And this man down here in the dirt with the cap on, that there is uh, Dr. George McDonald, who is the lead uh, archaeologist who led the crews in there. Uh, this picture shows two main things. One is the sediment from the glaciation, all that dirt and sand, as the ice was melting and deposited this dirt on top of the artifacts. And uh, another thing it shows is the depth of the living floor that was some 50 to 100 centimeters below the Earth's surface. So after 13,300 years of dirt and debris and everything blowing and riding over this area, it buried the actual uh, site, was no longer on the surface. So digging down that deep in order to find these artifacts. That first point, like I said, being a Clovis point and being one of those formal 4,600 pieces, um, that's the artifact that was first found. But underneath you see a pile of debris and um, little chips. And that talks about the geology of um, the material that they were using. We found some 25,000 chips off of the stones as they're taking this raw material and reducing it down to the desirable tool that they're trying to create. So that talked to us about their knowledge of geology. A lot of this material that they were using to create these stones right on site, they were actually harvested in different locations, some of them being as close as 10 to 20 kilometers as the crow flies, and other materials coming from 100 kilometers away. So again, they knew what they were looking for. They had to go out and search and find it. Um, the material that they had, they had to sort of source locally because at the last of the glaciation, east of us, of course, we got the Atlantic Ocean, north and west was still a solid block of ice. So coming into Mi'kma'ki, you basically had to resource your materials very, very close to uh, what you called home back then. Um, the Department of Education was calling that an Indian arrowhead, but it's... Uh, Okay, that uh, it's probably about oops, probably about four or five inches in length. If you put that on a bow and arrow, um, it wouldn't fly very hard, far, and it wouldn't hit very hard. Another thing is, bow and arrows weren't invented thirteen thousand years ago. Uni came into play about um, eight thousand years ago in Africa and China. So by the time the rest of the world tied into archery and the bow and arrow was a lot later. This was actually the projectile point of the Adelaide and Dart system. Uh, some of you may have some device very similar to this called a whippet or a chucket for throwing a little tennis ball for your dog. If you own a dog, you may own a whippet or chucket. And again, it's just a lever that has a little claw on the end. You put the tennis ball on the end, and with a simple little flick of a wrist, you can throw that tennis ball quite a distance. Well, this is the same tool that our ancestors were using 13,000 years ago here in Nova Scotia. And um, it's basically a lever for throwing a very, very flexible spear. And that is the atlatl. Uh, and again, we had uh, some of the tools that we had, like the projectile points and the biface knife blades. Uh, in the cracks and crevices of the stone was dry blood. And we could scrape off enough blood back in the day, this is in the 60s, you needed enough material about the size of a pop bottle cap. Like today, you could literally do it with a flake of dust. But um, back in the day, to get a, a good analysis, you needed quite a bit of the material. They scraped up all this blood and put it in to uh, Prince Edward Island to be analyzed. And um, it came back. And it tested positive as caribou kin. It wasn't the blood of the caribou, but it was the ancestor of the caribou 14,000 years ago when we had the large megafauna. Now, the thing about caribou is a lot of people know what that is. That's our animal that pulls Santa's sleigh. It's also the, uh, the animal that you find on the 25 cent piece, uh, the quarter. People using that word caribou, they don't know that that's a Mi'kmaq word. Comes from the Algonquian family of languages, and um, the original word in its pronunciation is Kalibu. 
And uh, that's where we get caribou from. And even Kalibu itself, being in a Mi'kmaq language and being in the Mi'kmaq verb-based language, Kalibu means the one that shovels. And uh, that's what he does. He uses these antlers to shovel the snow to get to the grasses. And he uses these antlers to shovel the um, moss and the lichens off of the trees and rocks in order to feed. The thing about a caribou, he's not like a moose and a deer. It's like where the moose and the deer, they only have the males that have the antlers. Uh, female caribou would also have antlers. But that was his ancestor, the stag moose. He's about 150 to 170 percent larger, and that was our main source of meat, being a herding animal. Uh, like I said, we use the hides for the pelt, we use the bones for tools, the sinew inside for making ties and laces, of course the meat for sustenance itself, and even the antlers using those for tools and hammer tools. And uh, So there was quite a few different uses for the stag moose, very, very little of it went to waste. Uh, when I was a young fella going through school system myself, uh, one of the things we learned about culture and ancient history, we learned about King Tut in Egypt. And I was like, well, relative to today, that was only 3,300 years ago. When in fact, Nigmoy de Bert, 13,300 years ago, that's like four times the amount that, of time that took place. So I said, well, you want to talk about ancient culture and history, why don't you talk about here? in Nova Scotia itself and our people. And um, that's something that the education system uh, did not do. It's like they didn't teach about us uh, here when I was uh, in the, going through the school system when I was young. But again, that 14,000 year period, that takes us to the Wisconsin glaciation. Uh, this is a nice little map of um, North America as we know it today. Going back in time with glaciation and glaciologists, they show that 14,000 years ago was glacial maximum. And this is where the ice range went all the way down into the mid United States. And that time period, like I said, the currents are coming up from the Gulf. Uh, the warm waters are melting the ice on the eastern coast. And as the temperature is increasing, the vegetation's kicking in, the animals are starting to move into this area, and the people are migrating from the southern part or Northern USA into this area as the lands became available. And our connection to those people are still today. When you talk about the uh, Algonquian language family, it covers some 55 different tribes in Canada and the United States, and one sort of become another. We ourselves are known today as the Mi'kmaq. Uh, when you take a look at the uh, tribal people down in uh, the area between New York City and Washington, D.C., those are the Nipmuc people. Nipmuc is singular in our language. Nipmuc means I'm your friend or I'm your ally. Where us up here, where the Mi'kmaq, that's plural. And that means our people, our friends or allies with your people. And that there is the um, name that we were given basically by the French. Had a wonderful relationship for 80 to 120 years with the first settlers that came into this area. And then when the English moved in, um, they sort of anglicized it to Micmac. And um, that's what we were known of until just recent times with the Micmac Indians. But again, that refers to our relationship with the people that were here first. And um, a lot of people say like we're not really Mi'kmaq, that there is um, the name that were given to us by Europeans. Uh, ourselves, we call ourselves the Olnu, and Olnu again is uh, very closely derivative of Inu, and some of the people that moved into this area moved on to other places. Uh, this is basically glacial maximum. When you take a look, 13,000 years ago, the pockets of ice are really melting. Uh, that the Laurentian Channel is basically, I don't know if you can see my mouse moving through here, but uh, that big gap between Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, it's very, very wide and it's very, very straight. That means there was a large volume of water moving very, very quickly during a short period of time. And even when you take a look at all of the erosion that was taking place on what was the shoreline, you can see that that water pushing and gushing out, there is 
are erosion scars that go way, way out in much farther than this one's dripping off of the sides. Now, glacial maximum, the ice was some two kilometers thick. And as it started to melt, of course, with two kilometer thick ice, the water levels are much lower. So that's what we're seeing here is that um, area 13,000, uh, moving up to 11,000, you start to see some of that greenage kicking in. The white areas are still ice. The greens are basically exposed pieces of land. Uh, 9,000 years ago, we're coming very, very close to the shoreline that we see today. Although you could walk from Nova Scotia to Prince Edward Island, it was still a land bridge. And even today, the, um, the scallop draggers that are in the Northumberland state, straight there between Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, sometimes they drag up artifacts. That were running over the communities that inhabited that area. Uh, even seeing Sable Island, the size of it, there's a whole series of islands that go on to a sort of northeast of Nova Scotia that run into Massachusetts. And there's a nice little bird by the, um, by the name of the Ipswich Sparrow, who still migrates on those old lands now that even years later, the, the land pockets are a lot farther apart and they're a lot smaller. But that's a little Ipswich Sparrow. He definitely uh, still flies those old ways. Uh, 6,000 years ago, very, very similar to what we have today. Uh, not much land change. Uh, like I said, coastal erosion hasn't been a big part in the last 6,000 years because uh, you're basically coming down to um, the volcanic basalt. That a lot, a lot of it is along our shoreline. But even when you take a look at Google Earth through the process of LIDAR, uh, LIDAR is satellite imagery that can see through the canopies of trees to give you different elevation. And it can also three, see through water and ice to um, show you what the landscape is underwater. And again, that scar that's been left there, that was glacial maximum. And as that ice field melted, you can see the erosion channels that are out there. And this is probably a um, a technique and a technology that goes back some 15, 20 years for the LIDAR system itself. And that's where our GPS has come from, our global systems, our, our, our little phone uh, apps that we have that tell us where we are. That's all coming from satellite. So, so does this info. But again, when the Europeans first came here, 1492, I guess is what we're calling for a date, but we know that uh, Vikings were here earlier than that. Uh, Scottish were here earlier in 1492 with um, Henry Sinclair. Um, there's uh, even evidence of the Chinese being here in the 800s, the year 800. You take a look at some of the oldest global maps um, that we have. The Chinese have a map that they produced that shows North America, Central America, and South America way before Christopher Columbus even thought of. And uh, like those maps, they even show like uh, areas like the um, St. Lawrence River and the Mississippi River. So they not only explored the shorelines and the coast, but they were into the interior and had very, very detailed maps of the elevation and the movement of water in the interior land. Yep. Oops. And uh, like I said, the Thank tribes you. here. Oh, sorry. Someone, someone talking? <laughs> okay. Uh, I was going to say that uh, the when the Europeans first arrived here, the Mi'kmaq people had treaties signed with neighboring tribes, some 13 different nations that cover us here on the East Coast, all of our neighbors. We had the Wabanaki Confederacy. And again, in that verb-based language, Wabanaki means people of the dawn or people of the early morning light. And that's very, very true here in the land of Mi'kma'ki is Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, the eastern shores of New Brunswick, um, the northern part of Maine and the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec. We're the first ones to see the light as the planet Earth turns into the sunlight. And for them to have a science that knows that we are the first people, the people of the morning light. It's like, you know, it shows our our knowledge of the stars and uh, 
that again is definitely another presentation when we talk about the movement of the earth around the sun and the changing of the seasons, uh, the moon phases that there is all another lecture that we could really, really get into for, for hours on end. But that that word itself, Wabanaki, it's, uh, it goes more than just a, a name. And in a verb-based language, it does take meaning to another level. And again, those tribes of the Algonquian language family, there's 55 tribes in Canada and the United States. And this shows you that area of these uh, nations that speak a very, very similar or united language. And um, again, when you look at that map in that area, it talks about people being Wedjiskaliakti. And Wedjiskaliakti means that we come from this land, we come from this habitat, we come from this environment. When you look at that map and you look north of us, you're talking about the land of ice and snow and tundra. You go to the west, you're running into either the Rocky Mountains or the southwest, you're running into the Great Plains. That's a different environment and a different way of life. So your teachings from the land are going to be different. So you've got a different way of living and you're a different nation. And that's all people are. People are where you come from. And the Mi'kmaq people over here in the east, we migrated from the south into that area. Then we moved up north and we moved out west. And we became the Mo Mohawks. We became the Nishnabi. We became the Ojibwe. We became the Cree. It's like we're all still part of that same brotherhood of nations that moved around. And being a researcher and educator, I spend a lot of time talking to other nations across Canada in different conferences that we run into. And you definitely see those similarities in our culture. Now, when I was a kid in school, they told me that our ancestors came from China across the Barren Strait and up from Alaska and down in through the West Coast. And I'm like, that's true for some of our nations. Uh, when you take a look at British Columbia or you look at the northern part, uh, Nunavut, um, they're very much connected to the Asian culture. Uh, they not only look Asian in physical features, but their language is very sort of lyrical. It's not the same guttural language that the Algonquian language is. Uh, we don't use the same set of vowels and consonants. And um, yeah, their language is quite a bit different. And again, even looking at things like music and art, uh, they look very, very Asian. I mean, music is definitely a reflection of language. And the rhythm of the language is basically what you're talking about when you're creating music. And as for artwork, uh, the West Coast art, the Haida art, um, that the Salish, uh, Coastal Salish, uh, they look very, very uh, Asian, as well as their, their color palette, as well as the symmetry and the designs that they use. Um, yeah, they're definitely different than, say, the Northeastern woodland style of art. I'll tell you a little story uh, about um, Chief Gerald Tony. He's a former chief of Annapolis First Nation. When he was a young man, he was a mine surveyor. And uh, he was up in a remote mining camp right on the border of Alaska, about 200 kilometers from um, Anchorage, Alaska. And he came across a Cree man from northern Manitoba. And this man said, I trapped for six months of the years. I trapped three months into Anchorage and I sell my furs. And I trapped three months back home and I sold my first to the Hudson Bay Company. So Gerald invites him in for a cup of tea. And he said, oh, you mean Bedawe? And Gerald said, what did you say? He goes, Bedawe. He goes, that's our Cree word for tea. He said, actually, it's our Cree word for broth because you can make tea out of anything that you boil. And Gerald said, man, you got to be kidding me. He said, I'm from 6,000 kilometers from here in the valley of Nova Scotia. He said, I'm Mi'kmaq. And our indigenous word for tea is Bedoue. And Bedoue and Bedoue are basically just a difference in where you put your emphasis on what syllable. And even here in Nova Scotia, as um, Cynthia was talking about uh, the different uh, languages, you get, you get dialectic differences from each one of the areas that we have and uh, just close little proximity of um, the maritime provinces. Can you imagine the differences that you're finding even between um, Nova Scotia and Alaska? 
But again, it's demonstrated to Gerald Tony just uh, how far our language has traveled and how old it must have been in order to travel that far uh, during that length of time. Um, I've been told that at the point of European contact, the Algonquian language was one of the largest language families on the planet Earth, second only to the Mandarin language in Asia. And uh, definitely that geographical range uh, demonstrates that. Again, taking it back to a little closer to home, Mi'kma'ki, the land of the Mi'kmaq, and those nine different or distinctive dif, uh, districts. Uh, we look down to the valley of Nova Scotia, you've got Gespawick. And that basically, oh, I'm going to bounce up here. So you see down the valley of Nova Scotia, you've got Gespawick. And when you look up at the um, Gaspé Peninsula of um, Quebec, it's Gaspawek. And Gaspawek and Gaspawek are, are almost the same because you're almost saying the same thing. Going down to the valley of Nova Scotia with Gaspawek, Gaspawek means land's end. When you come out to there, you're basically surrounded by water all the way around you. Now, when you go up to the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec to the Gaspawek, that there is the end of our land or the end of our territory. You go beyond that, you're running into the Iroquois and the Mohawk. So that verb-based language takes it to a whole new level of understanding. Uh, we've got Sicknick, the area between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick that runs along the Tantramar Marsh as well as uh, the river basin, all the waters that run out uh, St. John River Valley. It's like that whole area when you look at it, um, the Mi'kmaq word Sicknick means marshy area. It's definitely the largest marsh area around here. Now that played an important part during the first 200 years of European contact because what we had for currency here was the fur trade. And again, fur bearing area or fur bearing animals, the most desirable species are basically beavers, um, Mink, muskrat, you're going to find all these animals located mostly in a marshy area. So that's why this area was known even for territorial fighting. Uh, the Mohawks would come into this area to harvest furs and milk. Mi'kmaq didn't want them here. So there was battles between the Mohawks and the Mi'kmaq until we formed treaties. And even in one of the signed treaties that we have between the Mi'kmaq and the Mohawk is there is an open grave in Mi'kmaq territory for the first Mohawk to step out of line. And again, that same treaty says that there's an open grave in Mohawk territory for the first Mi'kmaq to step out of line. So whenever we get together, my executive director, Donald Julian, uh, he'll remind people of that just, for a, just to get a laugh and to sort of relieve tension and pressure. But that Sicknick area is definitely um, known for its marshy area. Eskigaweg is the area between Halifax and um, the Canso Causeway. And you can see, like, you know, there's not a lot of mountains there. There's not a lot of valleys cut through. It's basically a plateau, very, very flat along there. Eskigaweg means skin dressers territory. And this was the migratory path of the caribou herds and the um, the stag moose herds that we had going through Mi'kma'ki. They're a very, very smart animal. They're not going to expend their energy climbing over mountains and crawling down valleys. They stick to the, the, the valley system where it's easier to walk through and uh, expend a lot less energy that way, as well as the great hunting grounds. Uh, you find a lot of archaeological evidence, uh, even projectile points. Um, the majority of them are projectile points, whether they fall or whether they're broken. So if you can imagine someone hunting and missing one of these animals and hitting a rock, it's just going to snap off and lay there where it broke. And uh, that's what we're finding today is evidence of the skin dressers. And again, there was a, quite a um, organization of trade. So if you had something in one area that you didn't have in another, there was a lot of trade, whether like, you know, you've got salmon that's sort of more related to the um, tidal waters and the Minas Basin. And if you needed to trade it for either stone material that you need to make tools or whether you need uh, caribou meat or caribou hides uh, to 
support yourself. That's what these areas were, areas of trade. Uh, Abiguet is Prince Edward Island, and Abiguet translates to a small body, a small body of land that sets out into the bay. And that there is the bay that you see between um, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. It just sits nicely in there, small piece of land that sits in the bay. And uh, as opposed to Tocum Cook, Tocum Cook that sets across the sea or a large body of land that sets across the ocean. And Tocum Cook is definitely that. But again, that refers to our name for them. Uh, that's not what they called themselves. That's what mainland Mi'kmaq used to call the people that lived over there. Uh, Unamagi, I mentioned early, just like Mi'kmaq is the land of the Mi'kmaq, Unamagi is the land of Un. Uh, Un land translates to fog, the foggy area. And because of the um, cold waters coming down the um, St. Lawrence uh, Channel and the warm waters coming up from the Gulf Stream, they meet there right at Cape Breton Island. And Cape Breton Island can be foggy more days in the run of a year uh, than mainland Nova Scotia. So definitely the foggiest part in our area. Uh, Sigaban Akadik, then again, Akadik is the place where you see places like get on our map, like um, Sibigan Akadik, uh, Stewie Akadik, uh, Ben Akadik, Trakadik. Akadi Akadi, this, this is basically a prefix for the later part of the name, Akadi being the place where, and in this case, the place where the Sibigan comes from. And looking at Sibigan, it's basically a plant, and uh, it was one of our main sources of carbohydrate. When you're looking at the root system, it's a tubular plant. And it looks almost like an onion ball, but when you peel it off, um, it tastes a lot like a potato. It's just a little bit more fibrous. Uh, the fibers are very, very thick in it. But when the Europeans were asking us, like, you know, what's what's that like? They're like, well, it grows underwater and it crowns up. Like, you know, you can see the top part of it when you're basically canoeing over it. It looks like someone threw a whole bunch of onion rings in the water. And they're just sitting there, these little white rings. So we're pointing at European gardens. We're like, well, it's like that. It's like you know, something that grows halfway up. And it's a tuber. So it was called a, a brown turnip um, by the Europeans, but it's like, no, it's not really like that. When you see something crowning up that comes up like head first, when you think of a woman who gives birth to a baby, the baby comes out head first. Uh, that's your subin. That's like you know, your subin, subagin, subaganakadi. It's like it's all part of that language and vocabulary built in. But again, you can grill it, mash it, fry it. You can slice it up and deep fry it into potato chips if you want. But like I said, it's just a little bit grainier. Uh, quite common throughout um, Eastern North America. This is where you're gonna find that plant as well as where you're gonna find it found by different names. Common plant, of course, from the Europeans who were traveling over here. And so they knew all this, um, uh, but even looking at that uh, area there, you see two common names being rabbit's head and arrowhead. Uh, this is where the rabbit's head come from. And again, looks like the head of a rabbit with these two little ears. Another one is the arrowhead. It looks like a projectile point with its little um, notches on the sides in order for hafting. So just common names based on the culture. Now, this is what it looks like in the water. You see that triangular plant. And even looking closer to it, um, it's also called like uh, some of the other names is known as duck potato or goose potato. And again, the ducks and geese rely on this uh, flying across their migratory path. Uh, they need carbohydrates to form as energy too. When they fly the Atlantic flyways and the um, Eastern flyways of the migratory birds. Um, yeah, they need the carbohydrates from that plant in order to get the energy to fly thousands of kilometers. And you see that every fall. And the cool thing is I've been out to areas and you see the ducks coming in or the geese coming in and they all land over in one corner of the lake. Now you take a little paddle over there, you're gonna find Sibigan. <laughs> like that's what they were after. And like I said, some of these migratory birds are flying all the way from like Newfoundland down into the very Southern part of uh, uh, South America. Uh, they and again flying out through the ocean as opposed to along the land sides. 
right? The slag's land. Some of these birds really, really don't see land for, for days. Even looking at the plan itself, you see that the Sibigan on the left, it has a center part that the veins come off of. But we have another plant that has ears on it that is very similar in shape, but it has a main stem that goes from the middle. And the veins come off of the uh, main stem. That there is very, very important to understand because if it comes from the veins from the center or the veins from the stem, uh, it means whether it is edible and good or whether it's toxic and poisonous. You don't want to get into the wrong plant. So when I show the young fellows that, I'm like, is that good? And they're like, yes, that's a good plant. Like, is that good? And they're like, no, that is not a good plant. And you're ready to enjoy your sibigan. And they're like, sibigan, that looks like cauliflower. I'm like, no, that is cauliflower and peas. I said, sibigan is the other plant on the, the other food that you're seeing in that little brown potato with. And again, as carbohydrates, one of the main types of nutrients, uh, most important source, not only, not only for energy, but once it gets into your um, digestive system, carb try that again. Carbohydrates, um, they turn it basically the, your glucose or your blood sugar. And uh, your body uses this sugar for energy in your cells as well as tissue and tissue regeneration. So it's not only just a food source, but it's also an important medicine. It does promote the, um, the uh, regeneration of cells that are damaged. Uh, we've got Pictuk which is right smack dab in the middle there. You see that uh, Pictuk means, um, it means where the um, ground gases erupt and uh, Pictuk. And uh, when you take a look at Nova Scotia's geological map and you focus basically in on that little shark fin just before Cancer Causeway, you see all the volcanic fault lines that are on there. Uh, they're still active today. There's still rumblings and little earth shakes and earthquakes and tremors that we have in that area. So it's still very active. And what's happening is when things um, move around and they crack in the seams, uh, you get material being released from these cracks. And sometimes some of the vapors that come off of there, they're toxic vapors and being coming from underneath the Earth's crust and cool veins, there's all sulfur veins. So it's very much the place where ground gases erupt then and even still today. Uh, we even have a character in our culture and our stories by the name of Jepichkum, the great horned serpent. Uh, he basically lives underneath the ground. So when the ground shakes, that's Jepichkum. When you see the ground crack open in a zigzag pattern, that's the slithering path of the serpent swimming on the ground. He's got two horns, a red horn and a yellow horn that can be seen flashing from these cracks. And the last part of it is the hissing of the serpent, that, that sound like a serpent or a snake. It's like if you're unfortunate enough to stick around to hear that, then those are the toxic gases being released from the Earth's crust that can literally kill you. So what we try to do is paint the picture or image of this in the minds of children. So that way, in times of land change here in Nova Scotia, uh, they knew what to look for. They felt the ground shaking to get out of the area as fast as they can. If they saw it crack open or even flashes of magma in the form of red and uh, yellow colors to get out of the area. Because the progression of events that happens, the end result is those toxic gases being released from the Earth's crust in the form of that hissing sound. And um, that's what we wanted to do was a lot of our legends, a lot of our, um, our stories that we have, they talk about boundaries and borders and uh, they teach about like, you know, places to go. It's like we get so many spirits of the wood, like the natural things that we have, fire, water, uh, wood, stone. It's like we got uh, wick a lot of moons, wood a lot of moons, wood a lot of moons, skedag moons. It's like um, all these different spirits spirits, mooj, 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 you're hearing at the end that there's spirit. And again, it's fire spirit or water spirit or wood spirit or stone spirit. It's like all these different spirits of the environment, the borders and boundaries. We don't want our kids playing in the woods at night when there's nocturnal animals that like the soft flesh of little children and coyotes, wolves, uh, different animals, bears, uh, different things that they could come into. 
at nighttime. So that's why we tell these stories is to just tell them about the bad things that could happen. Even that movement of land that we have here in Pictou and even in Nova Scotia, uh, this was not a landscape that was carved like you know, 200 million years ago. This was done 6,000 years ago during the um, um, minus basin geofracture. It split and created the uh, Bay of Funde moved farther into Toro and created the minus basin. And the liquid material was pouring out in one layer. It would hit the water and cool. And the second layer would come out from under its crust, pour over it, and form these layers of volcanic basalt on our coastlines. And uh, even while it was still in that sort of semi solid state, the earth was still moving and it basically folded and crunched and pushed these in different directions. And um, that happened during the period. Like I said, if this happened 6,000 years ago and our ancestors have been here for over 13,000 years, they were here the day that this happened. And we even have stories that talk about this. This here is an area of um, the province of Nova Scotia where right underneath the surface there on the top, you can see volcanic basalt and it matches with the volcanic basalt at water level. So originally that was down there. But because of plate tectonics pushing together, one of these things popped up and it created these raised beaches. And we have stories in our inventory that talk about the days the waters ran backwards. Well, if you can imagine an elevation change from a piece of land that's right there on the shoreline where it meets the ocean, all of a sudden being 150 feet in the air, it's like water runs downhill. So you got a little stream that flows into a creek, a little creek flows into a brook, a little brook flows into a river, and that river is going to flow to the ocean where it meets on the shoreline. All of a sudden, that, that area is now 150 feet in the air. The water would indeed run in the reverse direction. So even times like, like the inventory of Goose Gap legends, the time the rivers flowed backwards, these are actual occurrences that happened here in Mi'kma'ki. And they're sort of recollections of people and stories. And the greater the story is, of course, the deeper it's going to be go down into your culture and the longer it's going to be told. Glooscap legends were a big part of our culture. And like I said, going through all those different uh, districts, uh, those are not stories that we created, like, you know, of recent time. These are embedded in our language and our language is a gift from our ancestors that have been created thousands of years. And those stories go along with it to form what's called our cultural memory timeline. When you work with um, scientists today, um, you're basically confirming the stories that we have here in Mi'kma'ki. Uh, there's been a phrase coined by Dr. Albert Marshall from Eskasoni First Nation and his late wife, Dr. Medina Marshall. Uh, both of them are elders, both of them are very well respected uh, educators. And um, they talked about a theory called Edabumptum. And Edabumptum in the Mi'kmaq language means two-eyed seeing. And that means about, these are our stories and our legends that we've had passed down from generations to generations for thousands of years. And they point to a time period of them actually happening. Um, and then even uh, you've got confirmation by science, the Western science world, that there is that second eye. And uh, that basically tells us that our stories were true and our people had knowledge that uh, they had taken Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge, the Mi'kmaq ecological knowledge, they've embedded in a story form and passed on these stories from generation to generation. And that information, when you look at it, it still tells you the truth of it that took place years and years ago. So we got a couple of minutes left, I guess, in our presentation. I don't know if I'll pull the plug now and uh, maybe do a little Q&A or be good there. Sure. Cynthia? Yeah. Thank you, Gerald. This, oh, you're very uh, welcome. It's just totally, like, I grew up here in the region, and I just never knew there was such a rich 
culture and oh. embedded language, like in the, the language that the words I was using actually had such deep roots and, and oh, yeah. historical roots. It, it's just fascinating. Um, oh, we we had one question. Talk on that. <laughs> That's a magic one. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what might be coming up in the future there, Gerald. That's right. <laughs> Um, we did have one question earlier on. I think you sort of answered it, and I, but I'm not sure. Okay. For, uh, Daniel Hill had asked it about, uh, he was curious what separated the distinct regions. Was it geographical linguistics? I think you actually yeah. sort of spoke to that, but I wasn't oh. sure, Daniel, if you wanted to, if that's oh, no. um, what the purpose, uh, the focus of your question was and whether Gerald had answered that in the. No, not necessarily, uh, but uh, I, I can go farther into that. And <laughs> what it was, was it was based on watersheds. And oh. like other than Newfoundland itself and um, Prince Edward Island, which are distinctive differences, um, Newfoundland was combined with Cape Breton Island, and that was um, Takam Koka Konamagi. And Prince Edward Island was combined with Pictou County and Anaganish County, and that was Abiguadak Pictou. But the other districts that are in the mainland, they were um, formed by watershed systems, which were basically on the highest mm -hmm. points of elevation. You poured a glass of water on the peak of it, whatever ran down one side was one district, and the other district water would run down the other side. Now that's all water is, like that creates these water systems and watershed systems. But one of our elders told us that the earliest flags that were flown here in Nova Scotia were an eagle feather split in half and flown on the trees on the highest points of these crests. That gave you a a, an idea of which district you were in. For example, oh. if you were harvesting a um, deer in one district and it was injured, and it, it still moves when it's injured. It's like you got to track it. If you tracked it into another person's district, you had to find a representative from that district in order to, to claim your game. And usually it ended in, the, like I said, these treaties and agreements where um, you take half of it, I'll take half of it. You take half home, we'll keep half of here. But again, those districts were well designated by elevation. And oh. uh, yeah, uh, um, Roger Lewis from the Nova Scotia Museum of Natural History in Halifax did an amazing um, amount of research on that and worked with a lot of different ones. And even through time, there was like seven different um, uh, relationships to the division of the districts, but they were based on European things like um, the Nova Scotia County system. The 18 counties we have is like, okay, these counties are part of this district. It's like, well, that's not the way that we used to do things. And then another map was designated as like, well, they did it by water. So then they divided it by the river system. It's like, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about water sh uh, shed system, which is the highest point of elevation that leaks down into areas. And uh, yeah, Roger Lewis's work is probably the most well-respected and um, things that people cite whenever they're talking about the districts. So, yep. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks, thanks to Hell for that uh, question. And yeah, I hope that answers. Uh, Kara Thompson had her hand up. Uh, Kara, you go for it. I, I have kind of a big question. You may not be able to answer it. Um, thank you, first off. My God, this was one of the most informative things I've ever attended. But mm -hmm. also, um, I just remember back in the day, uh, the history books that I had in junior high and high school were very much Mi'kmaq were a little tiny picture over here, vague recognition that they ever existed. Um, do you guys plan uh, sort of the, the cultural center as a whole or any sort of group you're involved with to actually put together? I would love to have a history book with this material in it. Um, I worked at Marconi campus here in Sydney. I would love to have this information in a book I can share with my students yeah. um, and just in general for educating Nova Scotians more because the history is so rich and so big and most of us just don't know it. Um, is that something that you guys are looking at doing sort of long term? Very much so. In fact, we have been doing it. I started off with the Confederacy in 2005, and there was very, very little out there. But we produced some four books with the Department of Education, and we're actually still working on cur curriculum continually. Uh, we've got all... What, what happened with the Department of Education was back in the day when I started, they used to have educational outcomes yeah. that you had to do that. Th those have been eliminated. And yeah. Now you can just do and say whatever you want. So there's no continuity. There's no, and people are pulling things off the internet, and we're like, that's not even us. It's like, oh, yeah, 
So we've written our own. And if you take a look at Nigmoe Debert, the um, website that we yep. have, um, it does have those documents in okay. there. And one of them simply titled Gegi Namoe, but literally meaning the way of the life of the Mi'kmaq yeah. here in Nova Scotia. Yeah. It would be and great to have this published as a book I can put in my library. Tons. Love yeah. it, love it, love it. Thank you so, yeah. so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, so we have four minutes left. We have one more question that came up in the chat uh, from Andrew Reynolds. He was asking, were mussels, either freshwater or marine, ever an important mm -hmm. source of food? <laughs> That's an awesome question. And I love this one. And the thing is, there are shell middens all over Mi'kmaq where evidence of Mi'kmaq settlements were. And they use, of course, the um, the seashells and the, the shellfish that we have in abundance. And you see these dump piles of these shells. Now, the archaeologists are going through that. And um, Matt Betts, actually, from the Museum of um, Civilization in Ottawa, I think it's the Canadian Museum of History now, it changed the name. but Matt Betts was working on shell middens. And he said, why are we finding all the different shellfish here in Nova Scotia with the exception of mussels? And today, Mi'kmaq eat mussels by the pound. It's like, you know, it's a delicious seafood. But uh, back in the day, our ancestors did not eat them. And they were not found in the shell middens. And when Matthew addressed that to our elders advisory council, one of our elders said, you don't eat your food's food. And you leave the mussels for the eels. Eel in the Mi'kmaq language is kadok. And mussel in the Mi'kmaq language is kadokla. Kadokla means the one the eel likes to eat. Eels were more important to our culture. So what we did was we left the eels for the eels and harvested the eels. And uh, yeah, that was an excellent question about mussels. But shellfish, oh, everything. And the cool thing about shell middens is in the deterioration process, it seals whatever's in there. So we can dig into shell middens. Uh, we even found a, a flute. And this flute was made by the from the leg bone of a deer. And uh, it was radiocarbon dated at 1,700 years ago. So we're talking for just a little under 2,000 years, the Mi'kmaq have had flutes and flute music here in Mi'kmaq. So, yeah, you're finding a lot of evidence. Uh, we found a whole bunch of turkey spurs, which are basically the back of a turkey's leg. He's got this little hook. And, um, yeah, a lot of the turkey spurs, a lot of, a lot of people were saying that um, Nova Scotia never had wild turkeys. And we're like, number one, it's like we got evidence of turkey spurs in our shell middens. And another thing is there's a Mi'kmaq word for turkey. So you wouldn't have a word for turkey if they didn't exist. <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you for that question, specifically on mussels. It, it was what was considered a tabooed food. It's like something that we did not eat. But you don't eat your food's food. <laughs> yeah. So much, Gerald. This has been fantastic. I've learned so much. And it just leads me to wanting to know more. And to, uh, oh, so I, 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 I second what Kara said. I would love to see a history book on this. Oh, yeah. outside i guess outside of the curriculum that's more for everybody to read uh right. so we'll be in touch all right <laughs> uh but I, I wanted to say thank you on behalf of the council of atlantic academic libraries and our members because we, we it's been a fascinating discussion we also had members here uh from copal the western regions and they uh they also mm -hmm. uh, i'm seeing all the comments they just love this presentation uh it mm -hmm. was we i learned so much about history of Canada that you never learned in the schools. Oh, yeah. Um, and and uh, even working I'm, with, um, um, I was going to say, Trish Shell from the New Glasgow Library and uh, did a session with them that was recorded and posted online. So again, you can, that's a different topic. So that might be worth a look. And that, again, through the Nova Scotia Libraries. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Uh, I'll, I'll so, have to look it up. Um, yeah, they're but really I getting me out just, there. Yeah, there you go. Um, just uh, for, uh, I want to thank you, and on behalf of Call, we will be making a, a donation to the Mega Mawe uh, yep, Divert Cultural point. Center in your name. Uh, so thank you so much for this presentation, and uh, oh. as you can see from the comments, I'll I'll send you a 
the comments afterwards so you can have them uh, to, to read oh, as well. Great. All right. Well, thank, thank you, everybody, for, for joining advice. us. <laughs> <laughs> have a good one. You have a great day. Okay.